Um, I will not bore you further. Let's get right into the final talk. Ladies and gentlemen, the mythologists, we have readings by Anand, Anand Neelakantan and Vamsi K. Jaluru, and they'll be introduced by Aditi, who was here in the morning. So, Aditi, it's over to you. Thank you so much. It is extremely heartwarming to see all of you glued to your seats in this bad weather. Thank you, first of all, before even we begin our session, to all the readers who've made time in the day and have turned up for the session. Thank you so much. We all have read Ramayana, Mahabharata, have seen uh, Mr. Sagar's uh, editions of, of our epics on Doordarshan. The whole country came to a standstill when Mahabharata was aired. Although those, those kilas of uh, Thermacol would keep moving in the background, but, we're, but we would nevertheless be glued to our televisions in 80s and 90s to just see what our epics were about. Today, we are here to discuss the people who revisit those epics. Today, we are here to discuss the people who rediscovered those epics for us, that is, the mythologists. And the mythologists we have today are two of the very good best well, One is a bestseller, and one is a good seller. <laughs> Thank you. We have Anand Neelkanthan and Vam Sivuluri with us. Who have, who have looked at Indian epics from two very different spaces. So I'd invite immediately to both of them, how do you look at your, how do you look at our own history from the, from the perspective of being a mythologist? So we can start with Vamsi and then we can go to yeah, Anand. Thank you. Thank you, Aditi. Thank you for coming. Um, yeah, my first novel was called The Mythologist, so I'm Totally delighted to be here in conversation with uh, Anand and Aditi and all of you. Uh, I think if I had to summarize how I look at uh, mythology, it's in three broad ways. As an academic, as a fan, and as, for lack of a better word, I'll say believer. So I'll tell you in a minute uh, what I mean by each of those uh, terms, particularly the last term. So as an academic, uh, I t because I teach media studies, I study culture, I'm a student of media and culture, I am utterly fascinated by uh, mythology and the role it plays in India. Uh, what we call the myths is essentially how India has been knowing itself and the human condition and the cosmos and the living world uh, and politics and dharma and duty and ethics, virtually everything under the sun for thousands of years. So it's a vast cultural phenomenon and it's also a living cultural resource, you know, because in many other contexts, mythology. Uh, has, has been fossilized, it's been frozen, as we spoke about earlier. Uh, but in India, it continues to live and thrive. Uh, so one way I would like to <laughs> summarize, I think, the influence of mythology in India as an academic is that long before there was Bollywood, we had mythology. I mean, so our Puranas, in a way, are the, are, are the Bollywood of eternity, but finessed, you know, made very, very significant because of the spiritual and ethical strivings. Now, as a fan, uh, I enjoy mythology like all of us. I grew up reading Amar Chitrakada and Chandamama comics, uh, not comics, the Chandamama books, uh, uh, the, the old NTR movies like Maya Bazaar. And of course, now I'm delighting in the new rediscovery of mythology in books like Anand's and Amisha's and so on. Uh, now, the third part is, is a very uh, strange one. That is what I, for lack of a better word, said the believer's part. Now, I don't necessarily literally believe that uh, there was a time when chariots flew. I don't know. I can't say they did or they didn't. So I don't take mythology as a literal account of the past, but I take it as something more than just an ordinary story. So Tarzan, Phantom, they're, you know, fun. They're fantasy stories. But Krishna, Rama, ultimately for us, are still gods. So I'm very intrigued by the question of what it means to know God or gods through these stories, through movies, through popular culture. So. That is the third part where I have no firm answers, but I do feel a certain kind of adoration and reverence for what we call the myths. But I think that that is a very valid standpoint because having known Vamsi and his academic background, he has a PhD in communication from University of Massachusetts and he teaches, he's a professor of media studies at University of San Francisco. I mean, to engage in, in something that has not been explained scientifically, through a rationalist perspective is something which is very difficult to do. And now from this point we go to Anand who, who is a B.Tech 
and who is a manager in Indian Oil Corporation. But most importantly, he is the author of Asura, 2012 CNN IBN bestseller and Ajaya, which is crossword number one book since last eight weeks. And it also appears in top five of other charts across the nation. So what is your perspective, Anand, on this? Thank you. I am so happy to be this Kumbh Mela of literature. Mm -hmm. See, mythology, talking about mythology, I think the term mythology itself uh, is a misnomer. This is the Indian way of telling history. I believe these things would have really happened. We tell history in a different way. And now I challenge, we, we have learned history in the western style in the schools with the date, what happened, when the first war of Panipat happened, when the second war of Panipat happened. If you ask the date, only answer you can give is it happened after the first war of uh, Panipat. So after that you don't remember anything. But these stories, all Indians, whether they are literate, illiterate, whether they have read the book or not, they remember these things and all the Indians believe it has, how it has happened and it has definitely happened. That's a belief. Some people may draw, many people, most of the people see gods, some people don't, but that is immaterial. But this is the, our way of telling history. Now, coming back to the way in it, which it is portrayed, See, many of the, at least my generation grew up uh, with uh, Ramanan Saga's uh, technical aid, uh, Brahmastras, where two arrows will come like this, uh, with, uh, and they, they will both come, say hi to each other, and one will collapse. Where the same soldier would be killed and would be alive again in the next scene. And next episode, because so extras. many extras only you can afford. <laughs> so, but that is what, that is a one, one way of looking. If you see our tradition, these Ramayana, Mahabharata and all the Puranas get reinterpreted every era, in every village, every language again and again. There is no correct way of telling this. When will a correct way of telling is what? Correct way of telling is trying to achieve perfection. The only perfect thing is death. Only death has perfection, that is complete. So what is something which is alive? It keep evolving. So these Ramayanas and Mahabharas, we are still writing it. Valmiki and Vedavyasa are the first writers. But the entire India and even perhaps the entire South Asia is writing and rewriting Mahabharata and Ramayana for the last 4,000, 5,000 years. And this process will continue. So each era we are finding it. That is why Mahabharata, that punch word is, no, Sambhavami Yuge Yuge. My entire theme of Ajaya runs on that. So I, am I have tried in both my books to find parallels to the present day world and this has been done by authors in various eras in various cultures, everybody can identify with that. I read in one of the reviews uh, that just came in, in a leading daily about your book that it's been beautifully done from the loser's perspective, what is that about? See loser's perspective in the sense, so many people have written about uh, Victor's perspective, there should be somebody to write from loser's perspective, that is the first thing. Second thing, what has happened is, uh, see I grew up in a place where this is, uh, see in my town, my village, now it has become a town or a city or the su uh, suburban hellhole that uh, clone all over India. It looks alike, every city in India looks alike now, with some mall, some multiplex, same kind of dress people. So all towns, uh, they have lost their individuality. You cannot, you take a photograph and show, show it, you will not be able to identify which city it is. But, uh, village where I grew up, it had its own distinct culture. There were around 107 temples there. So this was a part of culture and we were all asked to think about the story. The stories were uh, told every day. It's not that we have read Mahabharata or Ramayana. I don't think many of us would have read the originals. We would have rather heard it. Now you would have read it, but mostly first time you would have heard it only. You, have, you would have heard it from your uh, parents, grandparents or something like that. But the problem with me was, I think I was born Asura, I had this uh, streak <laughs> uh, kind of thinking. What happened is I was, I used to keep mum, this kind of uh, story sessions were there. So I used to keep mum, but I used to always have a cringy face when they say something which uh, I cannot digest. 
So one of the priests in the temple told me, you should open up, you should ask questions. That is how you learn. So the person, this Harigada, what we call, they say, you are talk, talking about Ramayana. This incident happened, I don't know whether I can tell it, but it happened in the sense, uh, he was telling about uh, the devotion of a squirrel. You might have heard about that story. When Rama was building the bridge, the squirrel uh, will go into the water, dip into the water, then it will roll on the sand and then it will go there and shake. So they ask, uh, uh, after some time Rama gets, Lord Sri Ram gets curious and he asks, what, what you are doing? He is telling, I am trying to do my part. He was told in a such a beautiful way and uh, everybody was so moved. Then uh, the Rama catches him, catches the squirrel and he gives a pat on the back. Pat on the back and that is why it has got uh, three this thing. Then he asks, okay, son, what, any questions? Then I ask, then Sita would I look like a zebra? <laughs> so I was escorted out. If Rama touches three times, uh, a line comes, then what would have happened to Sita? Alright, so obviously there is a new approach to the stories of the gods here. <laughs> So then, then I was called back, I said, if you go like this, you will get beaten up, you will not grow up at all, <laughs> you will die before that. So does that happen in your book? <laughs> no, I have not gone <laughs> Thankfully. <to. laughs> then my approach changed, then I started, okay, I started approaching it from the loser's perspective, but that total irreverence, that changed, because these are all things which touch the people's heart. Yes. So it doesn't mean that I should write uh, just for the heck of writing it. Mm -hmm. I have tried to find logic and other things in this. But if you view it from the other side, that's all. That's something very interesting you just said about mythology being a misnomer. Because it's actually about, it's actually a retelling of our own history. Well, something similar was attempted by Roland Barthes, who was a French semiologist in 1957, when he was trying to look at signs as, 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 the, uh, as the reservoirs of our, of our contemporary realities and how they played out to exhibit or to put forward our own social history. Well, at that point, I'd again like to go back to Vansi because he's a, he is the intellect, intellectual here who is constantly looking at myths from the rationalistic perspective. If I may just tell you a bit about his book called The Mythologist, where, where the boy called Parshuram, uh, the opening lines are very interesting of the book where he says, well, I was just a god. As a, as a child, I was almost as a child. I, I was almost a god. Mm -hmm. And the deeper you go in the book, you realize that this boy has lived his childhood believing that he was a god because he was nominated to play the Bala Krishna in his grandfather's film. So that's how he lives through the myths throughout his life and keeps struggling to strike a balance between a reality and the mythical structure that was developed in his persona right in the very childhood. So I think Wamsi can talk a bit more about his book and maybe then we can sure. go to the reading as well. Yeah, so I'll talk briefly uh, about, uh, I guess, Roland Barthes and my journey from uh, being a Marxist-trained academic to somebody who still, you know, with a straight face says, I consider mythology stories of the gods. Uh, so, and, you know, kind of this strange intellectual journey I, I'm in, and I'll just read a page from the, the mythologist. Uh, so, yeah, so I encountered the word myth, which uh, obviously I think is an insufficient term to, uh, un to describe how we in India look at these stories. Uh, again, as Anand said, I don't think there is only one right way to say it or the correct way. Uh, but uh, the mythology, the term mythology is essentially not a very indigenous concept uh, because it has all sorts of implications. I, of course, uh, encountered another use of the word uh, mythology when I was studying uh, in the work of Roland Barth and semiotics uh, because I was trained in British cultural studies, uh, that's as most academics these days are in the social sciences and uh, humanities. Uh, so a myth, according to Barth, is basically a story, an explanation for the, natu for the social order. You know, it's when we assume something to be true and it's not necessarily so, and it has political consequences. So it's usually a critical approach. Uh, now, so that approach has been used a lot by academics uh, in explaining, or should I say, explaining away uh, the, um, you know, Hinduism today, um, you know, academics like Wendy Doniger and others, I think, you know, there's a lot of uh, knowledge, there's a lot of usefulness to what they do, but sometimes their analysis doesn't fully go to the ways in which uh, I think we 
understand and live with and live in these stories. You know, that's, uh, and these change, obviously, generation to generation. Uh, you know, Dada Saab Falke to NTR, NTR to Ramanand Sagar, Ramanand Sagar to Amish and Anand. These, it's an ongoing journey. It's like these waves of stories going back and forth. Now, uh, so, I mean, I, the squirrel example, actually, I have a small episode with a squirrel and hummingbirds and whatnot in, in this book as well. It's one of my favorite stories from the Ramayana. And of course, the point of the story was every act of devotion is important. And now, another way to, uh, you know, to look at it perhaps would also uh, to help us recognize that our stories have come out of a very deep and perceptive engagement with the non-human animal world, right? I mean, our stories, Jatayu, Garuda, Hanuman, Ganesha, uh, the nameless squirrel. Uh, so all these characters also tell us about something about the way in the Indian subcontinent we have lived in somewhat of harmony with nature, right? And uh, you know the monkeys, the vanaras. Uh, I think there is so much more still to be uncovered. So, so we are living more in myth than we are talking about it accurately today. So that's kind of my self uh, critique as an academic. So I think academia today has barely scratched the surface of what mythology means in India. That's wonderful to say. So, uh, and I sincerely hope that when more and more mm -hmm. storytellers, you know, get into the action, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we are going to force these stories and we're also going to force the world to say these stories are beyond questions of God and belief, but, you know, they're, they're, they're stories that are going to give us a great deal of meaning and help make the, better, uh, the world a better place in some ways. You know, that's kind of my hope about what these stories will achieve. I mean, Mahatma Gandhi, you know, pretty much became who he was as a great soul, as a great man, because of two or three simple stories. And you know, the stories of, uh, you know, uh, Raja Harish Chandra, for example, the stories he heard as a child. So I think that's the way many of us look at these stories, you know, that we do want to learn some good qualities for, for them. And of course, we do live in an age of questioning and, uh, you know, wit and, uh, you know, irreverence, so that is also good. Uh, so anyway, so I think the, the journey of rediscovering mythology in India, particularly in the media age and the global age, uh, is only just starting. Uh, but anyway, so uh, uh, very briefly, to, uh, if I may uh, just read the opening line of the mythologist and then uh, I'll hand over the floor. Uh, yeah, so the mythologist actually is, a, is my, uh, my first novel and it started as an attempt to retell the story of Perseus and Medusa because I believe that Medusa was a good... Uh, metaphor for television, right? I mean, Medusa opens her eyes, you freeze. TV is like that, or your iPad and iPhone. You look at it, the light comes and you turn into rock. <laughs> so that was my ambitious idea. Eventually, the mythologist turned into a novel about, I guess, the social landscape of mythology in India. So it tells the story of this young man called Parshuram, who's a grandson of a great mythological movie maker. And it shows us the different ways in which myths have come to life in India, in politics, in everyday life, and so on. So Parshuram's sorry story, of course, is that uh, he was born into a great, uh, you know, uh, movie family. Uh, no coincidences are just that over here. And he almost became uh, a child star. He was asked to act as Krishna uh, next to a great star called SLM. Uh, no connection to NTR. <laughs> so um, anyway, so this is uh, Parshuram's lament at, at what seems like the end of his life. As a child, I was a god. Now, if only that were true, what a beautiful story my life would have made. The truth was, I was only almost a god. Almost, Parshram. So close, so far. All the yearning and pining and unattainable longing kind of stuff. All the Devadas, Meranam Joker, Man of La Mancha, and the blind hungry guy who's cursed to have his food stolen by the birds every time he sits down to eat in Jason and the Argonauts kind of stuff the stuff of poets and rich casualties. That is the reality, that is the truth, that is the way it is now. But, I cannot help this one last but. I have to redeem the reality of what my life really was with just one more thought, one more wish, a dying man's wish, as they say. If only my life hadn't been the way it was, if only it had been what it might have been instead. If only, myth, truth, what was what might have been. Come to the same thing only, I know that, a poem. I read it in Delhi, there was a girl there who might have been reading it too. Anyway, what was and what might have been come to the same thing only. So th this is how reality begins or ends. Not with what was, but with what might have been. What I might have been was no ordinary thing at all. I might have been Krishna, a god. So that's Parshuram. That's Parshuram.
That's Parshuram striving to strike a balance between the myths and reality. And now from here we go to Anand. Anand, we'd like to know how you look at your mythical structure. Like the way Vamsi just said that, you know, it's about creating the social history. And you've talked at length about how your landscape appears and, and how your childhood uh, affected your way of looking at it. But then, as you say that there are many oral traditions, there are various ways to look at uh, the mythical structures. How do you see these various multifarious voices con will, coming together in your book? I will give you one, one, two or three examples of it. See, in my books what I have done is, Asura is uh, told from the viewpoint of Ravan. Okay, if Ravan and I use lot of folklore for that. So in South India, especially in parts of Kerala, Tamil Nadu and all, and even in Jain version of Ramayana, Sita is the daughter of Ravan. Okay, the one mistake people point out what Ravan has done was to kidnap Sita. The moment you change that, the moment it becomes that it was his daughter, and he had taken, and when he takes her back, he takes her back when Lakshmana mutilates his sister, that is Shurpanaga. At that time, he takes back, and he says that my daughter is not safe with them anymore, so I am taking it back, taking her back. The moment you do that, the entire perspective, see Ramayana, if you see, it's a classical story structure. There is a big, powerful king. Okay, how is Ramayana? I will just analyze for two minutes. Sir. Sure, please. The classical way in which Ramayana has been done. Uh, there is a big, powerful king, a demon, demon emperor, Rakshasa. He is the most powerful man in the world. He is a Mahabrahmana. He is a learned man. He knows to play Veena. He is, he, Ramayana is built up so much. He is such a great, learned, scholarly, evil man. He is so powerful man and he has conquered all the world. And in Valmiki's Ramayana, Rama is not a god. He is a prince of a small principality, whereas Ravana is ruling the entire world. I am not talking about Ramayana and Sagar's uh, Ramayana. Okay, I am talking about the Valmiki, Cla Valmiki classical Ramayana. Mm -hmm. How Valmiki, sage Valmiki has written it. Mm -hmm. Now, Rama keeps, wants to keep his woe as a principal man. He goes to the forest to keep his father's word. And they suffer in the forest. He is willing to take that suffering. So he, he is classically the underdog. He doesn't have anything and this powerful man kidnaps his wife. And he has no army to speak of. Only he and his brothers are there. He doesn't know where his wife has gone. And he has to take the help of the monkeys or vanaras or we call them monkey men, vanara, tribe, whatever it is. He has to take their help and compared to what Ravana is, they are nothing. The power of Ravana, his sons, they are nothing. And then the classical, classical war, the underdog versus the rich, powerful man, evil man starts. And Rama kills Ramana and then we get a 5,000-6,000 year old bestseller. You really see that. It's the oldest story of humanity. It's a classical three-act story structure if you see that. What has happened in the process over the years? The role got reversed. Rama got elevated to God. It, is a, it was a story of a man who stood by his principle and he fought about fought against a powerful, arrogant, scholarly, good and Ravana is a like any other human being who gets power. He is not an idealistic man. He has good qualities in him, bad qualities in him. So Rama is an ordinary man, he fights him against a powerful like Ram was the uh, classical Amadmi. So, <laughs> From there, it started. But over the process, what happens? Over the process, what is happening to Amatmi now? <laughs> they get deified. They become God. They cannot do anything wrong. They become like that. Valmiki never claims that. Valmiki has never hidden any of the Rama's faults too. You cannot blame Valmiki for that. Is If you ask me, Many people rate Mahabharata as a greater work. I am an admirer of Mahabharata for the sheer philosophical depth of it. But as a story structure, I think no story, no story in the world can match Ramayana. Because Valmiki has clearly placed both Rama and Ravana. He has shown all the failings of Rama also. 
that is why he has not hidden sita's episode otherwise if it was his aim was to make rama the perfect person that he could have clear, uh, clearly hidden it that he had uh, abandoned sita it never happened right later we started deifying because he was a, such a great person we started deifying rama and uh, rama could do no wrong then politics started coming in earlier then people wanted to become prime minister so all those things happened in the process but what happens in this structure now what i have done is i just reverse the process now rama has become god he has become the most powerful person now so who is ravan now ravan is a rakshas a half caste his father is a brahmin his mother is an asura he grows up in an abject poverty not only in my story actual story also is like that from there he does his tapasya for me he is working tapasya is nothing but his work he works for his uh, profit he works for his uh, empire like and he builds a great empire and he wants to save his daughter from this and he is fighting with the gods so again ravan becomes a amatmi here now version of the process so it is not you really see that the story structure remains the same same way coming to mahabharata which i had done See, again it is again another classical structure in which Duryodhana is uh, Duryodhana and Kaurav, hundred sons are there, hundred warriors. Hundred warriors are there, they are the royal kings and these people, they don't know who their fathers are. Later they were told that they are the sons of gods and other things, but there is a impolite word for that, which Duryodhana calls them. Who their fathers are, they, are, they don't know. they call their gods they are descended from the heaven all those things may be adding if you see the story structure and uh, duryodhan makes them go out after the game of dice they lose everything and then it is their right uh, fight to get their right back but again on the process what has happened indians being indians we have made them so perfect that duryodhan looks as if he is the greatest villain in the world which he is not so what i am trying is to i try to reverse the process now duryodhan is also asking questions to pandavas and krishna and all and questioning them so my story is all about questioning the conventional beliefs and trying to find the balance which the original epic always had so could so we get you to read something from your book then would you like to i would like to read only one small para all right it is not about my book i would rather prefer everybody buy my book <laughs> and read it <laughs> this is not a this i am reading why because it is not my creation this was told to me by my father who was learned in this he gave a totally different he used to give a totally different spin to whatever i am trying to do successfully or unsuccessfully or whatever some other he his version was separate when i had raised the question to with my late father el nilagantan he proffered a simple but beautiful explanation about mahabharata his advice was not to approach the mahabharata just as a story for it contains lot of hidden symbolism as for my father the 100 kauravas 100 is just a mere number 100 re- represents just numerous infinite they are only desires and follies of mind so the kauravas represent nothing but the desires and follies of mind dhrudarashtra represents ego ego is power ego is sitting on the throne ego is sitting in the throne of your mind it thinks it is the most powerful thing that is dhrudarashtra but it is blind and gandhari is gandhari is nothing but love maternal love love to all the desires your love for the desires of good things and other things love is also blind and it is married to the ego that is gandhari is and dhrudarashtra all these desires some are good some are bad so kauravas have both the prefix du and su sushala is there or du and su both prefixes are there because some desires are good du represents bad su represents good that is why duryodhana suryodhana that influx comes always so good desires will be there bad desires will be there but they are the product of ego and love or ego and passion okay that is one thing hence the desires are sons of blind parents mind and ego on the other planes pandavas represents the five senses five senses pandavas represent they are all married to draupadi who is also called krishna another name of draupadi is krishna that is black black represents anger 
and if you see vyasa has portrayed draupadi as a very angry woman she had her own causes for being angry but black represents anger marriage of five senses to anger that is blind passion okay that is with this this all the five senses go to the palace of mind that is kauravas palace and they have a game of gamble they they gamble with the desires like what you do in life try to understand the concept okay and they believe in fate because roll of dice is nothing but belief in fate so they don't believe in action they believe in fate they think that you roll the dice you will win why yudhishthira played the game of dice he thought that he can easily get the uh, kingdom from the kauravas so he didn't believe in action he play he played with the fate he had a war with his desires and this thing the fate and they lo- lose and anger is shamed and disturbed by the desires and fate the pandavas also another plane pandavas also represents five virtues yudhishthira represents wisdom as a son of kala son of time yama kala yama death is nothing but the god of time and yudhishthira is the god of time kala and you acquire wisdom over time so yudhishthira is the son of time yudhishthira represents wisdom bhima portrays strength as a son of vayu that is prana arjuna represents will power as a son of indra nagula and sahandeva stand for beauty and knowledge these are the five virtues to be had in the life and and they are also the sons of ashwini is the gods of dawn or the beginnings nagula and sahadeva of all good beginnings it is krishna who brings the pandavas and desires together at kurukshetra he brings all the virtues together at kurukshetra here krishna is the universal soul because again krishna is black black is the color of universe or your conscience black is the color of the depth so krishna represents a universal soul and here the virtues without he said whatever virtues you had you gamble you don't believe in action you lose but when when you work acts for your um, conscience and it is allied to the universal conscience consciousness that is krishna and you believe in action that is what is told in bhagavad gita you win that is what the war of kurukshetra is all about this is a simple explanation of mahabharata which my father had given mm-hmm. You know, it was quite good when you said that the readers should buy your book. But that gets me to tell you a short story. I was at the Assi Ka Ghat in Banaras a couple of months ago. And I happened to talk to a sadhu there who, who would be there for, for a long time. And I just asked him about the history of Ramayana. Because Tulsi Das sat on Assi Ghat and he finished the text. And I was just curious about what the... what the popular story is about it being in circulation in the hindi belt was was about so he said that tulsi das asked all the notanki wala all the theater performers of the region to perform his text and that's where that's what got ramayana a, a, a legitimate place in the oral structures of those times i thought tulsi das was a marketing wizard mm-hmm. and that's why we asked you to read so thank you so much and i think now i i i go to a very important question that's been coming in my mind for a very long time is that when you look at established mythologies that are closely intricately related to our religious beliefs from a rationalist and from the quote unquote loser's perspective are you somewhere questioning your own religious beliefs or i or does that take you to become a atheist at certain point of time when you are writing because it's a creative process and when one writes one is constantly questioning oneself so does that happen with both of you we could start with one sir we could should i mention my new book as an example to that oh yes. yes his new book yeah. maybe have an answer for it which is called <laughs> the god within the guru about within. the guru within yeah. about which vamsh is going to just quickly yeah. tell us about so this is my forthcoming book the guru within and i know this picture produces a strong reaction one way or another but i asked for an open mind for a few minutes while i explain the book and which also answers your question uh, so it's strange um, so yes we are here as mythologists but this book is in a way a uh, demythologization uh, so it's not necessarily uh, a take down at all 
because that wouldn't be true to my experiences or who I was or who I am or who I'm becoming. Uh, but it is a process of uh, demythologization and it is, uh, as you saw from the picture, uh, it is an account of my family's encounter with uh, Sri Satya Sai Baba. Um, so, um, well, so a brief family context and then I would like to just read the first page of the book so you know that uh, it's a non-devotional book and not a takedown book. I don't know what it is, but I think hopefully it will be an interesting book, which I hope you'll buy when it comes out in April. Uh, all right, so I grew up in a, in a uh, typical traditional, somewhat orthodox South Indian family and my parents worshipped the usual gods, I guess, Krishna, Rama, etc. And uh, we were not followers of any Baba as such. Uh, then in the early 1980s, uh, actually no, as a child in 1976, my parents once met Sri Satya Sai Baba in Hyderabad in a public event, my, I guess my mother being a public figure and it was, it was nothing, it was just a, you know, namaste, you know, nothing happened. We didn't come back and say he was God. We didn't probably necessarily say he was a fraud either. Nothing happened. It was just another social encounter. Then in the 1980s, uh, sometime in the early 1980s, my father uh, happened to come to this wonderful city for a conference. Uh, so there is a Jaipur connection to Baba and my family which somehow seems, seems uh, keeps coming back. Uh, so on the way back from Jaipur, my father found, realized that Sri Satya Sai Baba was on the same plane as him, <laughs> on the plane out of Jaipur. So apparently he just went and did Namaste and he says he felt reverential. He didn't think he was a god, he just thought he was a, you know, somebody he felt reverential towards. Uh, then a few days after, my father received an invitation to go as a visiting faculty member to the university that Baba was setting up in Puttaparthi, a small village in the middle of nowhere, you know, it's like Rayal Seema, very dry uh, part of Andhra Pradesh, very poor. This big university is being set up and so my father, being a professor, was invited. So he used to go and come and then he used to tell me, I don't know about him, but the university is great. It's very disciplined, it's well run, high quality. Then some, one day in 1986, he came, I remember I was in 12th class and said, I think he's real and that freaked me out because, you know, I was in 12th class and, you know, I was kind of getting over religion and, uh, you know, I was just a teenager. And uh, I said, yeah, yeah, take mom and take Amma and go, you know. So I didn't want to go there. Then my mother went. She kind of became a devotee instantly. Then she came back. Then finally, I ran out of excuses. I said, I'm studying for IIT. I'm studying for MSET. It didn't work. Finally, my parents dragged me uh, December 31st, 1986. And I have to admit that what I witnessed, um, you know, the quote-unquote miracle that I have no explanation for, so I, I won't even go there. But I witnessed something phenomenal. You know, I saw something uh, which made me realize that there was a reason why millions of people were calling this man God. And uh, so anyway, so then that started a very close family encounter with Baba, uh, which, uh, so for about two or three years after that, uh, you know, we were, my family was called very often for interviews. Uh, my parents, uh, asked him if uh, I could, you know, they were worried I would go astray. So they said, uh, why don't you ask, uh, could you please let our son study in your universities and, you know, you'll be, he'll be safe, he'll be a good boy. And he did one better. He's, he actually say, told me to go study engineering in a college that was run by one of his devotees. So basically he gifted me with a seat in an engineering college, uh, which I totally went and flunked uh, because I was very bad in engineering. And... Uh, so that was a very strange uh, encounter where I went to do something I was not good at doing, something I didn't like to do, but I probably did it because I thought, okay, I have this God and if I pray to him, he'll make me smart. Uh, but it didn't happen. Uh, so I dropped out of engineering. Eventually, I found my way into journalism and media studies. Uh, and naturally, you know, two, three years ago when Baba, and after that, we didn't have much of a, at least I didn't have much of a close interaction with Baba, but in a way, he, you know, he remained an influential spiritual and cultural figure in my life. So this book is an attempt to talk about those 20 years of a journey where you think of God as some kind of a magical being you pray to and get what you want, the normal Indian formula for dealing with God, you know, do a puja and magic happens. Uh, moving from there to some, a more deeper introspective understanding that whether you call something God or not, ultimately as human beings, we have to take responsibility for our lives. That's what I mean by the guru within. So very quickly, just the opening lines, uh, the preface, it's called a story about God. This too is a story about a phenomenon. As Christopher Isherwood says, a phenomenon is always a fact, an object of experience. 
The life of Sri Satya Sai Baba, like that of Sri Ramakrishna about whom Ishavud wrote, was a phenomenon. It was experienced directly and openly by millions of people. It was a part of our history. It began when India's oldest living generation currently, people like my parents, were children, in a time when India was still under British rule and in a village so small and remote, none would have known its name today. It began, most importantly, long before a phenomenon such as this would have been associated in the modern mind with the taint of fabrication, long before there was such a thing as Twitter or television. It's important to stress that part. In today's world, where, where words, images and tweets fly around in magnitudes of billions, it's important to remember there is still such a thing as a story born out of a direct experience, a face-to-face -face human encounter. The eyes of those who had seen Sri Satya Sai Baba, though, in the flesh, in the role of a wise Telugu elder, could not lose sight of what they had beheld. I was one of them. I witnessed it. I called it God as others did, but in this book, I do something else. This book is not so much about God as it is about the very human lives in which we find the necessity for something like God. It's a memoir of my life before and during the time I met Baba, and in parts a biography of Baba and my parents. It's about four human lives and an encounter that was as much about cultural and generational change as it was about spirit and faith. So you're definitely not at conflict with anything here. Anand, what is your perspective about questioning your own self when you are writing or retelling uh, established mythic structure. See, my stories are all about questioning. My stories are all about questioning conventions. Are you an atheist? I don't know. <laughs> You're a skeptic. <laughs> because, uh, see, uh, I don't go to go in any extreme position. Whether it is as a believer or an atheist, both are extreme positions. I think I don't have the knowledge enough to say that I know God or I, I don't have the knowledge enough to say that there is no God. I am just a seeker. So I cannot say that uh, that is a very difficult position to take and it's a foolish position to take. I am an atheist because uh, it is as if you are experimented with everything. Same way as if telling I believe in everything, I am a big believer so I do all those pujas. So I think this is a safe what I am taking now. So one quick point <laughs> to add, you know, usually one interesting thing I have noticed when somebody says do you believe in God, uh, there is an interesting response. I have heard people say God is, not I believe in God. <laughs> so in a way it's presumptuous, right, to say I believe or I don't believe. Because in a sense, I think the way I look at it today, you know, God is just a slightly uncomfortable word for reality. You know, and how can you say reality, you know, I believe in reality or no, you know, reality exists, right? So, that's kind of how I look at it perhaps. Well, reality versus myths versus reality versus myths. So, yes. I think the cycle would go on. Yeah. No, you see, any absolute beliefs like, leads to war and terrorism, fanaticism. Anything, see, even Mahabharata, if you see that, Pandavas are so convinced that it is their dharma and Duryodhana is convinced that his dharma is the right dharma, that war happens. So the entire problem of the world is because there are not, not enough skeptics. People think that, okay, this could also be right. When people think that only I am right, then the war and other things happen. So there has to be acceptance of the other's perspective from the flip side of the picture. That brings us to, to the end of the session and I would now like us, like the session to be open to the audience. Comments, questions, anything? Yes, we have. Very good evening to you, Vasu Mitra Bardwaj, a senior higher, higher management studies scholar, and I'm a. Good evening to you, sir. My name is Vasu Mitra Bardwaj from Jaipur. I'm a higher management student's program. I've done my MSP from IIM Ahmedabad and uh, UC Berkeley. I'm a communication student. Also, manager operations. Not very clear. Yeah. The voice is capturing on the mic. Oh, if yeah. you could replace the mic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Perhaps you could just speak up. Let's. Yeah, we yeah. can hear you. you. Just speak up. It's a small horn. So, uh, yeah. Oh yeah, you are loud. You're very yeah, much loud. Much better. Yeah.
See, I believe for loving, God is not required. For loving each other, loving as human beings, see, God is not required. See, God is just a name for what you give, in what you believe. It, in none of our scriptures say that you have to believe in God. There are, yeah, please tell me. Sir, 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 we have to give others also a chance yeah. to ask questions. Your question was addressed. Sir, we have a lot of people and a shortage of time. So, I'm yeah. just... We'll, talk. we'll come back to your Please question. It's a great question. We'll we come back to, to it. Yeah. Come back to your question. Yeah. 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 My question, my question is to Mr. Professor. Uh, le, before I uh, sir, put up my question, I like to say that I'm not an atheist and I, I want to ask that uh, is there any possibility that you know Walmiki Walmiki just you know woke up one day and thought you know let's just create Rama and Ravan and this 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 book and you know this is like they didn't ex exist before like is there is there any possibility that, that, that they didn't even exist and he just created two characters to, you know, inject some good values into the next generations. Okay, so did I ever wake up one day and yeah, really just feel, like that. Just, just think none of these people existed? Maybe I did when I was young, I don't know. So right now, I actually, I'm not even saying they really existed, I don't know. All I know is, I feel good when I go to a Hanuman temple. Is that, so, that's, that's, so it's very hard for me to say Hanuman. I, I, I do know people and friends and family members who have visions or they feel the presence of God and things like that. Uh, I sincerely, I, I operate on faith in a certain, I'm very aware. So on the one hand, I, I prefer to say God is rather than I believe in God. But then I'm very conscious that I'm operating on faith because I have no evidence, metaphysical, rational, whatever for something called God. Uh, but what I do think is important is cultural practice. Okay, that I look at spiritual practice and creative practice like writing mythology as essentially a cultural, uh, a, a, a form of cultural agency. So there are good stories. So if there are two books about, say, comic books about Hanuman, I'm not going to look at both with the same amount of reverence. If one is badly done and it's crude and Hanuman is decapitating people, blood is spurting everywhere, uh, I'll say Jay Hanuman, but I will not pick up that book. I mean, it's awkward. But if there is a beautiful uh, rendition, you know, that Hanuman is rendered in art with devotion, where he's shown uh, with, with a lot of grace. So I think in India, so, uh, you know, the, the artists, the sculptors, the playwrights, the poets. And the, the narratives. And the narratives. And the narratives have come together. So I think there is no right story about God, but there are better and worse stories. So it's about the cultivation of sensibility. That's how I look at it today. So is Hanuman the next focus for your next book? Oh, yes. I was uh, sub doing subliminal advertising. I'm working on a trilogy about Hanuman. <laughs> <laughs> Answering your question uh, simply, it doesn't matter whether Rama existed or not. If you want to believe in somebody who existed, then there are a lot of people who existed. Rama is an idea. Last session also I told that. It's about an idea. You call him Ram, you call him Ravan. What you imbibe the value, that only matters. There are historical figures. Why nobody, Chandragupta Maria was a great uh, empire builder. Why he didn't become God? Raja Raja Chola was a great empire builder from the south who conquered up to Singapore, Malaysia and all. He didn't become a God. But he existed. So existence or non-existence is uh, a non-issue. No, that is your choice. No, in all, all our scriptures it is said, the name is relevant. The path is relevant. Everything takes the same. It is only the devotion which counts. You can call Ravan also and pray. You will reach the same place. It is about love, as the gentleman said, ultimately, right? So You can call Jai, Jai Sri Ravan. <laughs> because, see, you see, Valmiki portrays Ravan as the greatest devotee of Lord Shiva. See, it doesn't matter. Either way or the other, it doesn't matter. Because these are all, this has got deep, rich symbolisms. We are just trying to tell another story in an entertaining way. That's another matter. But how, what do you read from that? Once you know both the perspective, 
the path to symbolisms and the deep underlying meanings will come out. You try that, then you'll know. So that's where the um, workshop of a mythology yeah. opens up. Uh, good evening, sir. Uh, we all heard the mythologies when we were young, and uh, they played a very big part in uh, giving us our moral compass because what's right and what's wrong was defined by the stories that we heard from those mythologies. Uh, for me, a big part of that moral compass being formed was my belief that those stories were true when I was hearing them when I was young. So do you think it's important for us to believe in the authenticity of a story for us to take values from that story? Yes, sir. If I may respond quickly, I think the story is told well. By all means, you are absolutely right to say it is true. I think the truth, I mean, Parshram kind of gets into this stuff later in the book, but I won't bore us with this. Uh, but I think the truth of mythology is not quite, uh, you know, historical truth in the Western linear time sense. Because we are retelling these stories. I mean, Krishna is coming alive every time you have children and you look at your son and say, this is a, I'm, I'm seeing Krishna in you. Shiva and Parvati are coming alive in those rare moments when your parents don't annoy you and you actually see your, this, you know, these two human beings there and say, these are the people who gave you your birth, you know, regardless of all the faults, when you can forgive them everything they've done. Uh, and you see, find examples, resources. For example, I just found this post-it here. It's an excerpt from the clay Sanskrit uh, Ramayana, Valmiki Ramayana. Rama says this to Kaikeyi just after he's been told like he has to get out of the family and the house. Aham artha paro devi lokam avastam utsahe vidhimam rushibis tulyam kevalam kevalam dharmam asthitam. So he's saying, look, I'm talking about money stuff here, not because I want any, you know, I'm making sure Bharata is, has resources to rule the people well. Kevalam dharmam, you know, so I'm not a Sanskritist, but that words felt very meaningful to me at an important point of my life. So I think um, it is important not to lose sight of the truth. And that is sometimes uh, ac something that academics are guilty of. You know, we academics look at it in such a scholarly ma manner. I was talking to Raza Aslan the other day, and you know, w wonderful scholar. And he was saying, you know, scholars of religion tend to put everything under the microscope as if our deepest beliefs, our lives, our struggles are just microbes, you know. And they are not. I mean, we find the beauty, the aspiration, our striving for love. In, in these stories. So by all means, I think if it makes sense for us to think Rama is real, we should. I don't think we should forget that. Well, Another the thing is morality. There is nothing called moral values which is absolute. What was moral 5,000 years need not, before need not be like Panchali marrying five people. That time it was accepted. So now, whether it is right or wrong, whether you can imitate that, it cannot. Because in Mahabharata itself, it is said that depending on the time and the place, the dharma changes. See, Sanatana dharma is eternal. And this is true about science also. We think science is absolute. Science is not. Had we been living 400 years before in Europe, they believed that 400, 500 years before in Europe, they believed that earth was flat. All scientists. That was absolute truth then. So anybody told uh, uh, it is round, he was uh, branded as a madman. So even science, it changes. Then why talk about uh, philosophy and religion? It is all to help ourselves. If, it, uh, if some of the stories help you to lead a better life, take it. If it, if it doesn't, leave it. It's a free country. And <laughs> our religion is the most flexible religion. I don't think if I had a believed in some other culture, I could have written any book like this. That also is there. I acknowledge that. Can I write a book uh, sitting in any of the Judaic religion? No offense meant for anyone. But had I been an Iranian, can I write like this? So that is the greatness of our culture. Self-criticism, self-doubt. Yeah, self-criticism, we have evolved through that. I think we are up for the last question. Good evening, sir. My question is to you. Uh, I've just purchased this book and it's very nice. Thank you. <laughs> Um, when you see Raman and Sagar's Ramayana, how much you are convinced towards the concept? Because uh, Ravan is only introduced when Surpanaka goes and complains to him about uh, about the misdeed of uh, Lakshman. But we have never heard, we have never read about Ravan that he was a great leader, or maybe why he was a Dashmuk. I am reading it for the first time in this. But Valmiki Ramayana is there, right from his uh, what all bad things he does, what all good thing he does, everything is there. 
But you are, con are you convinced when you see Ramana, I mean, uh, the, the television uh, uh, thing, when you see actual Ramayana, are you convinced with the concept they show all the things? Because I, I never, I never uh, seen that, you know, uh, they are showing that Ravan was a great leader or maybe why he was a Dashmukh or why this is happening. You know, I, I just want to ask how much you are convinced with the concept on television when it shows Ramayana or Mahabharata. You know, as I said, everybody has their own Ramayana. That is Ramayana Saga is Ramayana. That's all I will say. <laughs> yeah. That is one thing. <laughs> then, <laughs> yesterday, Thank you. Yesterday, Mrunal was there. She was telling television has its own compulsions. Yeah. She was talking about Saas Bahu serials, but it is applicable to any serial perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you, readers. Thank you for being a part of JLF's 8th edition. Please come back next year in bigger numbers, new authors, new books will be waiting for you. Thank you so much. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you for being a part of this wonderful festival, the very last session in close.